I'd now like to introduce the State Librarian, Dr. John Valance, to welcome you to the State Library. Thank you so much, Ellen, and I'm going to welcome you to the State Library. I have been introducing quite a few of these seminars over the last few months, and I'm terrified that I'm going to end up addressing the same audience and repeat myself. I can't work out how many of you have been to others of these sessions, um, which have covered all sorts of really interesting uh, areas of uh, library activity. Today, as you know, we're going to be focusing on digital collecting, which is uh, an area that this library has been, as you know, very, very closely involved with in, for some time. Um, and we're going to be hearing from my colleague Scott Wagen very shortly. Uh, at the end of this current massive digitization project, the library will still only have digitized around about five, between five and eight percent of its collection. Uh, and uh, it gives you some sense of just how massive this, uh, this project is, project to make um, material as accessible to the largest possible number of people. Um, and we're going through a re revolution, as I often say, on the same scale as the revolution that was brought about by Caxton and Gutenberg and the invention of printing and, and retail publishing and so on. Uh, it's a really exciting time to be working in libraries, whether you're working in Macquarie Street or whether you're working out in Cobar. It is just a transformational period. And uh, I'm just looking through the uh, program for today and uh, it's a very exciting one. Um, at this library, I like to say that we exist in order to help people find out where they're from, who they are, and where they might be going. And one of the most interesting digital projects that we're involved with at the moment concerns the collection of evidence relating to Indigenous language around New South Wales. Uh, those of you who know a little bit about the background to this might know that uh, the library contains lots of things like word lists, uh, indigenous vocabulary word lists. But what we're now working on doing is to try and capture the syntax and the grammar of Aboriginal languages. And digital collecting is a critically important part of this. In July, we are going to be opening here, uh, and it will also be available in due time online, uh, an amazing groundbreaking exhibition called Living Language, which is going to be the beginning of a program to try and make sure that we don't lose the extraordinary richness of Aboriginal languages as they're actually spoken and not just disembodied lists of words. So it's against that background that I acknowledge that we're gathered today in Australia's oldest library. Uh, on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. So I think you're in for a, a really interesting uh, treat uh, today. I hope you find it a very stimulating and rewarding day. I have been told by Ellen that some of you got up before 5 a.m. to get here. She always tells me that people, some people get up before 5 a.m. Who, who got up before 5 a.m. to get here? All right, well, thank you for getting up before five o'clock to get here. It's wonderful to have all of you here today, uh, and I hope you have a really productive time. And would you please welcome my colleague, Scott Wagen. Thank you. Now let me find my slides. Can I close this down? If you can minimize that, yeah. Yep. Hello and welcome everybody. Um, thank you for coming and thank you for getting up at 5 a.m. as some of you did. Um, today there's a, a lot of information that's going to be presented and from a lot of our subject matter experts in quite detailed areas. So what I thought I would do is take the opportunity to, I guess, set the scene a little bit or build a little bit of the bigger picture of where uh, all of the components of building a digital collection uh, come together. Now, um, digital collecting, collecting born digital or digitising your analogue collections or digitising donations of the analogue, are the two main components. And I've sort of brought them together uh, in the terms like building your digital collection. So what I've done, I've kind of put together a little bit of a planetary system here, or an ecosystem of all of the components that, that I think uh, 
go together to make up the topic that we're addressing here today uh, over the day through kind of specialist uh, input and detail in some of these areas. Now, I hope, can you read that? I hope, I hope that's clear up the back there. It looks like uh, it has a starting point and looks like it has a direction, but it really isn't a workflow. It isn't, it isn't really a, a directed timeline either. Um, I had another version of this where I tried to put to some linkages between a lot of these topics to show the relationships, but it ended up being a bit of an incomprehensible spiderweb to do that because truly the linkages and the complexity are, are, are very high with this sort of a, a multifaceted uh, foundations to that task or that goal of, of successful digital collecting. Now, you have to start somewhere though. So let's start it at the top, predictably at the top, and we'll go around in a clockwise direction, not fully, but sort of. Um, but like I say, you can, you can jump around a, a lot of these uh, spheres uh, as you need to, and not, there's not one of them you actually have to do first. And in fact, you can't just do one of them first without other things being in place. You can't begin your uh, acquisition unless you have some kind of sense of the storage or some sense of the format, how are you going to make it accessible and discoverable. So there's a lot of these things that are in play all at once. But like I said, you do have to start somewhere. So let's start with selection. So most of you from regional areas and, and even here in our, uh, in our metropolitan area, we do have a collection development policy which kind of like directs us to what we want to collect. Be it digital or analog, that's irrelevant. The collection policies are more at the principal level about what it is you want to collect. So you need, always need to have that as, as part of your background. If it's a digital, born digital, or if you want to digitise someone else's collection, you're still congruent to your collection development policy. And, and you'll find things within your uh, collecting areas and all that that have greater or, or less relevance. You'll also find things which come to you or you seek which have greater or lesser quality in terms of image quality. Now, I wouldn't suggest that you base too much of your selection collection purely on quality. If you happen to have uh, you know, the earliest photograph of Bondi Beach, yet it's a very underexposed glass plate negative, it's a bit murky. You don't, want to not, you don't want to reject that you know, based on its quality. The same if you have a photograph of um, Bob Hawke at the Jacaranda Festival sculling a beer. There's probably a lot of those around, actually. <laughs> but um, you know, you would still want that, even if it just taken on a, on a phone, on you know, an early digital phone. So quality relevance. So there you you find the balance between those things. The second thing is, and this relates a lot to the digital collecting and born digital, is that you're almost now at a point where you do have some influence over your contributors. So we have some guidelines here, and I think Matt may talk about those, Matt Burgess, one of our digital uh, collection analysts, will talk about that uh, today, I think, I don't know, I think he will. Um, and it, it is, it's an opportunity for us to actually be proactive in going out to, the, to your constituents and directing them as to do something a little bit better for, for your collecting. Um, and that's a little bit different if you're just digitising their old photographs. If you've got photographs from the 40s and 20s and et cetera, et cetera, it is what it is, okay? But new photography, new digital photography or videography or oral history recording, you do have opportunities to influence the quality. And that's an important sort of difference, I think, about digital collecting. So this is from our digital collecting strategy, and there are so many formats, as many formats in the, in the digital world as there were in, in the physical world, as there are in the physical world, because remember these things are still happening in parallel. But there are definitely new things. I mean, you talk about whole of domain, web harvests and e-books and e-journals, et cetera, et cetera. This is a, is a new world and it does come with quite a range of difficulties. And for people who um, are comfortable with um, collecting the newsletter from a local sports club when it's printed out and putting it on a shelf, very easy to understand how to do that. But if it's only now available as, a, as a, a PDF on a website, that does actually change the game a little bit. So the two components of building the digital collection are the digitization of analog materials 
and the acquisition of born digital materials. So, and both of these have their uh, underlying dependencies on different types of technology. So obviously with digitization, we can talk about scanners and uh, flatbed scanners and film scanners and digital cameras to collect that, to copy that sort of material. For born digital acquisition, you're going to be dealing a lot with like phones and all the video and the, the audio from phones, huge amount of still images coming off phones and, and point and shoot digital cameras and professional digital cameras as well. So there's a whole range of technology that you need to understand the constraints of it and the potential to get the best quality from that sort of technology in the same way as um, the difference between say scanning a photograph on a photocopier as opposed to copying it in a, in a high quality digital camera. You know, so there are all of those uh, differences that in the two worlds which you still have to address. So digital content is, is essentially is a file and there are many different file formats that you'll have to cope with uh, when you build your digital collection. Still images are probably the most well understood, whether it's born digital or copied in, in like the TIFFs and the JPEGs, that sort of material. Perhaps audio in WAV files and um, MP3s. This is sort of stuff I think most people now have some understanding of these sorts of files and kind of what it means to be that kind of a file. But when you talk about e-publishing and e-books, when you're talking about web harvesting, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, social media, and even email. These are the challenges for digital collecting. So I don't have all the answers to that, but Matt's just arrived and he does. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, metadata isn't new, catalog records, etc., etc. Nothing's new, but it's, it's even more important in the digital world because the physicality of a, a stream of bits and bytes is so far different from like a book or a manuscript or a photograph, okay? It's findability, it's discoverability to understand what sort of a thing it is. This is what the metadata is absolutely essential for. Um, and the classic metadata in, in its uh, administrative or its preservation or its descriptive type of metadata um, is something that you need to have a, a very good, uh, a good understanding of, but also a good um, spirit to address that really early on in the digital collecting process. Um, because there's some of that metadata that is kind of only available at creation point, and you don't want to lose that in the digital preservation sense. Um, file naming, of course, is, is really important too. Now, there are different theories on file naming. You can have like meaningless numbers that your collection management or your digital asset management system interprets and finds for you. Or if you have more simplified file structures and systems, you might be more comfortable having a file name that means something to you. No real right and wrong in that sort of stuff and, and uh, you know, there are different um, reasons for doing both. But the metadata, like I was saying, for digital content, the metadata is absolutely essential for that discovery and digital preservation. We're going around the, uh, the loop. Uh, we're about halfway now. Um, collection management systems and digital asset management system. Once again, absolutely essential to work with digital content. Now, in, in smaller libraries and in, in uh, less, I guess, um, developed uh, systems, and that you may only have a, a library collection management system which actually has to actually store and deliver your images. Uh, in a, in a, a better scenario, you would have a digital asset management system that was talking to your website and your interfaces in your collection management system so they can both do their own jobs uh, better. So digital asset management will provide you with uh, the ability to work with your preservation master files as well as creation and delivery of your access copies. In general, in, in sort of library systems, you, the delivery of uh, the images is really at the access copy level unless you have the ability to have a, a sound digital asset management system. I, I don't know really um, in regional and local libraries uh, what the uh, sophistication or the, um, uh, you know, the um, 
richness of your asset management systems are. But um, we have here at the library, we have uh, really come to terms with the, the needs for so powerful digital preservation systems, digital asset management, and collection management systems. So it's kind of like a, a holy trinity of systems that we need to effectively preserve and deliver our material. So we did. We just talked a little bit about discovery and access. Um, so I mean, some fundamental questions there is having collected your digital things, what is it that you want to do with them? How do you want to deliver them? Who do you want to deliver them to? But the second question is, who can you deliver them to? What can you do with them? So there's a whole set of topics that will be coming up today about copyright and restrictions, and also about cultural protocols like um, at Seal or on, you may be aware of that, uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders Learning Resource Network, I think, protocols about um, <clears throat> delivery, access, restrictions, uh, secrecies, and all of those sort of things relating to cultural content. So we'll hear a bit more about that today as well. Depending on the scale of your operation, some things are going to be really important. Project management workflow and the tools you need to actually do that. Now, if, if it's in a small local studies library situation, these may be less critical um, than in, in bigger situations. But once you start to scale up and you have uh, uh, regular and, and volume coming through that you want to collect or that you are commissioning people to, to go out and make and collect, you need to have a good workflow for yourself because you'll have material coming in It'll need to be processed. It'll need to be like ingested into systems. You'll have to have storage. You'll have to add to that metadata. You'll have to, uh, you know, determine your delivery protocols and that, and your access restrictions. It'll have to be stored properly and hopefully, like in a digital preservation sensibility, too, not simply a storage. And once again, here at the library, obviously, our the scale that we have here is uh, of a scale that we are really, really dependent on our tools and our workflow and our project management. In fact, our digitization project has a dedicated project management office with project coordinators. And in the last 12 months or so, we have built a workflow tool which actually links all of the different departments and, and specialty areas uh, from, uh, from a beginning to an end point um, so that the workflow so that the, the content at any point is, is known where it is. It actually uh, has its uh, information <laughs> added. It, it, it enriches as it goes to the point to the point where it's handed over to our systems which ingested into our repository. So that's perhaps a, a luxury or it's perhaps but it's a necessity when you're working at scale. <clears throat> I did mention storage. Um, Digital preservation, not the same things. Um, you can easily store those CDs in the third drawer. You could even have it a lockable drawer, so that's <laughs> preservation for you, isn't it? But it's not good enough, really. Um, people talk about um, cost of storage uh, increasingly decreasing, which I, in one sense is true. You can get yourself a terabyte there at JB Hi-Fi for less than $100. But once again, it doesn't constitute proper digital preservation. It's, it's simply like a, it's a storage medium, in a sense, kind of a bit ephemeral, really. Uh, CDs, um, obviously, the a bit of an obsolete technology now. We're moving on from that. We're going to hard drives and even SSD, solid state devices, for storage. But once again, these are temporary things. And hopefully, either within your own library or within your council, you have the ability to work with those IT departments to actually have a robust and credible storage and preservation uh, facility. So um, reliability and recovery are part of the, the really sort of essential things around digital preservation. And that's it's a little bit different to simple business backup. Digital preservation, and we'll hear some more about that today, some of the real uh, principles and guidelines for digital preservation of that digital content that you are successfully collecting. One of, the, one of the last things, or one of the things towards the end of the workflow chain, 
uh, is when you have that digital content and you, it's accessible, <coughs> is that the end point for it? What more can you do to that to actually make it uh, richer, to make the experience more engaging, or to bring things out of that content that aren't necessarily in that simple digital file. The simplest thing, of course, is OCR of printed material. Now, you can scan old newsletters from the, the fishing club, uh, and you can have a picture of that page, which is really not good enough. It's not You, you can OCR that, and then it becomes a searchable thing. Step one for a really simple amplification or an enhancement of that content. But there are lots of other things that you can do to that as well. If it's a handwritten manuscript, that whole OCR doesn't work as well, if at all. Um, so then you can talk about like getting that transcribed, crowdsourcing, volunteers. There's even AI uh, web technologies where you could submit handwritten things to, um, and with enough kind of like background learning, you can start to get some credible um, text base back from that. Um, tagging, which is, I guess it, it's really metadata, but there's many ways now to actually get some machines to do that tagging for you. And um, we have had, I think Jenna will be talking about some of that later today. Uh, we've had quite a few experiments um, which are giving us some really interesting and good results from automatic tagging for our images. And then voice to text as well, which I know we'll be talking about today, the Amplify. You may be aware of the Amplify. Uh, oral history voice to text um, transcription service and uh, facility that we have, um, which is a, bit of, um, a, a really, really, it's, it's just one of, our, one of the better examples of this sort of application of technology to enhance and amplify content. So back to the original diagram, we pretty well come around that. Um, don't think we've left anything out. So, but just reinforcing this. So, my role here today was just to kind of like set a bigger, a bigger picture, so you can see all those elements that are all uh, underpinning the success of, of digital collecting and building digital collections. There are some links which will be available. Uh, via Ellen, via the, the blogs and things like that. But the one I'd like to point out, which is actually a very good one, for the National and State Libraries of Australia Digital Collecting Framework um, from the NASLA pages. I don't know if you've uh, had a chance to look at that. Um, that's got a lot of great resources. In fact, these are the sublinks within that. So digital collecting principles, guidelines, frameworks, pres digital preservation principles, are a really good starting point for people who are embarking on this journey. That's all, until everybody else comes to you today with, to fill in all the gaps and to provide the detail uh, in all those topics that, that I've skimmed over. So, introduce Joanna Fleming, who's going to talk to us about metadata. about metadata. So I am Jo Fleming. I am the digital curation specialist here at the library. What does that mean? Uh, we, I'm working in an area that kind of digital curation goes across the whole lifespan of digital material and we're in a unique situation here where we actually do do that. So that's point of acquisition digital collecting all the way through to being involved in um, digital preservation and standards for digital preservation. So I'm going to give a a higher level overview of metadata because I know you're all in different situations with your systems. Um, and to me, metadata is the thing that kind of connects it all together. What is it? It's essential for um, managing digital files. Uh, it's information that can be embedded in the file, that can stay with the file. So if you're downloading it, you can, um, it's not an orphan, you could put references to your library, you could put copyright information in there if you wanted to. It's essential for resource discovery, just what um, Scott was saying, and it provides value, valuable information for digital preservation. So that's more likely to be a technical metadata. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break it down between digitised and born digital because my area is born digital material. We don't necessarily, I mean a file is a file once it gets to digital preservation system, we don't care how it was created, but in terms of um, discussing metadata, there are some similarities, but there are some differences and I'll probably focus a little more on born digital content, so that, that more digital collecting side of things. Um, so these are the things that are common to both. Don't strip metadata or you encourage people, creators, and when I say creators, I mean people who digitise material as your creator, even if they're in-house or they're an external provider, try not to just strip metadata. I know things like Instagram, if you're collecting Instagram, they do strip metadata, but if you can, encourage donors to not strip any metadata. And again, um, pushing back to creators. And that, um, again, I'm talking about digitizers and born digital content creators. So your digitizer can value add technical metadata when they're going through that process. And um, as Scott was saying earlier, we're trying to start, we, we have a better influence over um, born digital content creators uh, going out and saying, actually, we won't accept this unless it's in this way or that you've addressed this type of metadata and also give us, you're the expert on your collection, so you give us the title, you give us the descriptive information. I think that ego stroking is useful too in those, in those instances. So you get people, they're the experts, get them to give you the information. Standards, there's going to be a lot of discussion about standards today, so I won't go into too much detail because I know lots of other people will be talking about them in relation to specific content, but both digitised and born digital content have standards in terms of bringing digital preservation, for born digital, bringing digital preservation to the point of acquisition and encouraging people to lodge the material in that form. Obviously, if it's a JPEG file taken on someone's camera who was the only person on someone's phone, sorry, they're the only person in some flood region, we would take that, that's a preservation file. Um, we will always take that, that would be the master. But, you know, being able to encourage better standards. And then this is a big one, ensuring metadata integrity when you're moving files. So I'm going to show you, give you some um, examples of tools that you can use and a bit of hardware that can help with that because you don't want to, it's that whole chain of custody, the archivists in the room, that you want to maintain that integrity. Digitised content, I'm assuming that you might actually have, this is the sort of stuff that we have, that you might have, that you, it may be catalogued, the original material may already be catalogued, uh, they might have a title number, it might have descriptive information already. To me, you've got more control over your digitised collection because you can define the types of metadata that you're going to embed in those files, they're not the original object is over here and you're creating these files so you can say look put this descriptive information put this technical information and you can have standards which we do have standards across various uh, content I think Damien will talk a little bit about audiovisual standards and then if you're a digitizer is creating metadata they can embed that as well and you can also impose file naming conventions Im impose doesn't always work out that way, but you know, it, depending on how much power you have to push back to your um, the person who's doing that digitising for you, it's an opportunity to either have meaningful or more automated file names. So what I thought this is a, a, a higher level example of the type of things that we have in our um, embedded in our file. So most trying to keep it simple, basic. You got your title, you create a date a copyright statement, sometimes digitised by a company, like for State Library of New South Wales, a unique identifier of some sort, so for us it's our, ref co our reference code from our archival system and that is MMSID from the, just a, you know, a unique identifier from the catalogue record, so that if this say is an access file and you download it, your client can look at that metadata and then search for that record and then any kind of relevant technical information. So that's very basic, high level, that every file has that in it. Born Digital is a bit different. This is just some beautiful icons of all the stuff that we collect, way more diverse. And to me, one of the big things for Born Digital, um, ensuring the integrity of metadata at the collection point. Similarly with digitised, if you're bringing in content from an external vendor, you would have integrity in place. But for this, for us, it's about um, 
I'll show you, we use a, a write blocker when we're looking at content so that we're not inadvertently changing any of the metadata in the files. Um, we also encourage our content creators to provide, like I was saying before, to provide all of that kind of descriptive information. They're the experts, they know, you know, give me the name of that file, um, all the titling, the copyright information, the location, subjects, you can go as far as you want to or as far as you feel you can enforce that. Again, don't strip any metadata. And we keep the original file intact. We only embed any additional descriptive metadata into access copies or if we make a, well, no, if we were to make a modified master, we might embed some more metadata, but essentially we keep the original intact. We don't make any changes to that to maintain that integrity. So here's an example, very similar. Title, create a date, copyright statement, a unique identifier and technical information. So this is in our access copies. Again, develop standards where possible. Standards, again, I said standards are going to come up today. And um, metadata integrity is extremely important. Um, so here's some examples of software that you can use. So if you're, if you've got, say, a standard and you say to a digital photographer, you must provide this metadata embedded in your file. Don't strip your met technical metadata, and you need to go and check. There's a few tools you can use. There's Exif tool. That's a there's a command line version of that, but there is a GUI that's available, a graphical user interface that's available. It's pretty straightforward, easy to use. Photoshop, if you've got it. Adobe Bridge, you can um, see some of the metadata that you can't necessarily see if you right click and view the properties on the file. Um, metadata editor is another one. And um, media info is for audiovisual. I think Damien might mention that. No, maybe not. Um, BWF meta editor for audio. So there's a whole bunch. If you actually just Google metadata editor or metadata viewer, you'll find lots of different very basic um, programs that you can use to just open a file and see are there any like if it's a TIFF file are there are there any, is there information in all the tags is there nothing do you need to go back and say look you stripped out all your metadata actually what we would rather is your original version that has all that information your camera information your date to me a lot of the, the issues around um, protecting metadata integrity come around the date time information if you open a file, it will it can potentially overwrite your date time information. You might need that for a, um, that's a good chain of custody information. So we have got hardware. This is a write blocker. So it's just essentially a forensic bridge and it sits in between. You plug your USB stick or your heart, whatever it is, your hard drive on one end and that sits in between your um, the media and your computer. It doesn't change anything on that media. You can use that to do your browsing, so you get a large collection of photographs you want to go through and have a look at them. It will ensure that you don't accidentally make any changes, delete anything accidentally. Um, I think they'll cost you they're a couple of hundred dollars, but it's pretty, you can get them for um, SD cards as well, little small ones, but it just will mean that all of the original metadata created by the content creator isn't changed by you accidentally, which is one that we'll go into risks later when we talk about digital preservation. And then this is just a couple of resources on the higher level, um, more detailed stuff about METS. I don't know if people are aware of METS. It's just a, um, a metadata schema that you can use, but quite complex. We use it. Yeah, but in a more automated way where a script actually creates this large, crazy looking XML. Um, but we do also use a lot of spreadsheets for managing metadata. So we do both. Like we have the large scale stuff, but we also create CSV documents and ingest using those as well. Um, and then there's just a couple of links there. There's our metadata framework principles and standards. Now it says 2012, that's actually just being reviewed at the moment, but it is still fairly relevant in terms of cataloging, but I figured you would all sort of be across metadata cataloging stuff. And then you've got that other Library of Congress mods links, so you can have a look at those. I'll get those to you. That's the overview that I wanted to share today. Does anyone have any questions? No? No? All right, Thank you.
people are speeding through. This actually means, uh, Jessica, that you'll be able to do a slightly more leisurely... I'm looking for Jessica. Yep, thank you. You'll actually be able to be a slightly more um, leisurely approach if you would like. <laughs> so um, we're fortunate to have um, Jessica Coates here. Some of you would have seen the online presentation she did a couple of years ago um, prior to copyright changes. And so it's nice to actually have her here talking about the copyright changes. And other things. <laughs> No, 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 don't worry. I'll, I'm bound to take up the extra time without meaning to. I cannot lie. Uh, not only am I not the most uh, pithy person in the world, but I also am very enthusiastic about my topic. Uh, let me see, where am I? There we go. <laughs> can do. Da, da, da. All right. Um, so, uh, I'm here to talk about copyright. Um, for those who don't know me, not, my name is, is Jessica Coates. I work for the Australian Library's Copyright Committee. Um, I also work for another organisation called the Australian Digital Alliance. Both of them essentially argue for copyright reform in favour of the public interest. So the Australian Library Copyright Committee clearly um, focuses on libraries and archives. We are looking at putting you in the title, I promise. Um, but also, um, this, uh, but the ADA includes that group, but also the rest of GLAM, uh, the um, education, uh, so schools and uh, universities and TAFEs, um, the uh, disability organisations and um, individuals, consumers, research groups, and uh, even the tech sector. So it's a very big field. Um, but essentially, uh, so we do a lot of education in the libraries and archives realm um, and advocacy across both of them across all those groups. So what I do is try to argue to get the laws fixed to make things easier for you guys. Because, uh, I, oh, before we start, oh, and my background is I'm a copyright lawyer. I do have a law degree and even a master's. So hopefully I know uh, I can answer most of the questions. If I can't, I love getting, uh, you know, questions on notice and going back and working it out. It's really fun. I'm serious. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, one important thing to know is that we have a whole lot of resources up online at libcopyright.org.au, uh, so you don't have to furiously take notes. Everything I say here is written more clearly and exactly on our website, and we're actually making them even better and prettier. So if you come back in three months' time, they'll be even better. Um, but don't feel like you have to take um, notes all the time or anything good. If you want to, feel free to. So um, I know that copyright, a lot of the time will have, for those of you working with digital collections, um, particularly when you're working with things like audiovisual materials or trying to provide access in an electronic way, uh, copyright will have seemed like a big barrier. Uh, that will, it, you know, um, that will have been a problem. Um, so I only have a short amount of time, so I thought I would uh, focus on four messages, which are positive messages um, about copyright, which is great. We have lots of good news to say. Um, so as I said, uh, this may be your general impression about copyright, it often gets in the way, etc. But the good news is that we are fixing that. Um, uh, it wasn't always on purpose, I should say, that copyright got in the way, it was more that copyright had failed to update, to keep in line with new technologies and all that kind of thing. Um, and so we are gradually managing to uh, get through the process of reforms in the Act to uh, try to get rid of some of the barriers that are inadvertently there. Without hurting creators, we're helping uh, libraries and archives do their jobs better, which is a great compromise to be able to meet. Um, so uh, there's a whole pile of different one, reforms that have happened, uh, and because we've had limited time, I haven't spelled them all out, but um, I am, I've tried to pull out the ones that I feel like have the biggest relevance for this audience. If you know about one that I don't cover, feel free to ask a question at the end, uh, or, um, or pin me down later to find out about it, or jump up and down. Um, but the main ones that I um, am going to talk a little bit about are the changes to the legal deposit laws, um, then the uh, big omnibus bill, um, which a lot of you will have heard about that fixed, um, that did stuff to do with preservation and copyright term, and then finally um, focusing on the um, safe harbour reforms as well that have gone through. It's a very big ambit. And all of these things have happened in the last few years. It's amazing. Because nothing happens in copyright for years and years. Nothing happens. And then all of a sudden, it's all happened. It's great. 
Um, so the first one is for though the in terms of digital collecting, uh, and I will say I wasn't quite sure what the ambit was, so sorry if I've got anything wrong, and feel free to correct me later. Um, but um, one of the first and earliest reforms that happened that has started to make things a little bit better is that the laws are starting to make it easier for you to actually collect material in digital form. Um, both the laws and just the systems that are in place. Um, this is mainly at the um, big guy level, at the um, NASLA level, um, that kind of thing, that this is relevant because a lot of the legal changes are to do uh, were to do with legal deposit law. Um, but uh, it, uh, but there is a little bit of flow on effect, I think, that affects everybody else as well. So first of all, the biggest change that was a legal change was uh, the uh, new law that came through at the federal level for legal deposit, um, for electronic legal deposit with the um, National Library. Now they have uh, not only the right to um, uh, collect material in e-form, i.e. to when material is published in e-form, then um, there's then it has to be deposited now. Um, that was all extended to that um, with the National Library. But also, this is a really clever thing, they were given the right to proactively go out and collect anything that is on um, uh, the .au web um, domain, essentially. So they basically do a scrape. And they, they have to kind of ask permission to do that, but they deliberately included in the legislation that that included um, using an automated system. The automated system could ask permission, so essentially they can do a scrape. Um, and a lot of you all know they've actually been doing that for 20 years or so, uh, but it's legal now, which is really great. Um, don't worry, there was a good argument why it was legal before, but it's much more clearly legal now. Um, uh, and that, even though that is mainly at the federal level and at the National Library, um, it really has flowed down a lot to practices down below. A lot of the states already had um, some uh, legislate, um, some uh, had some flexibility in their legal deposit laws. I think New South Wales is one of the good ones. I meant to try, um, try to um, uh, work out which one was which yesterday, but then we had the new communications minister announced and it was distracted me uh, for the rest of the day. But um, uh, the uh, so, but several of the states do technically allow e electronic um, uh, collecting, but they haven't done it. They haven't necessarily spelled it out in the detail that was in the federal law. Um, so the norms that have been set by the federal laws are starting to flow down to the states. And I would say also you're likely to see the legislative changes go through at the state level to make sure that all aligns. And hopefully over the next few years slash decade, because uh, it can take a while to get these things to. I worked on this legal deposit changes that just happened when I it was a graduate in 2000, and it was pretty much in the same form it came through uh, in 2012, I think it was, um, in the last few, well, that's not that recent, but pretty recently. Um, so uh, the uh, so uh, hopefully these changes will flow through and affect um, uh, institutions at the state level um, and their ability to collect, still probably NASLA, but because um, it's a legal deposit based thing. But that has also led to um, the setup of NED. I'm sure a lot of you know about that, the National E Deposit System. There's, I don't think I've got that quite right. Um, anybody who knows the actual acronym, I apologise. I have? Good. Um, uh, but NED is basically setting in a place. Uh, in uh, place a system for publishers to be able to voluntarily deposit their material in electronic form straight away um, to fulfil their um, legal deposit requirements at both the federal and the state level. Um, it's setting standards that, and it's being shared by all of the NASA libraries setting standards that will be Australia wide. Um, a lot of this, um, it's not a requirement that they use the NED system, but um, it's designed specifically to be better um, and more efficient for publishers um, and therefore, um, and also for the libraries. So hopefully there'll be a big encouragement for people to move that way. Um, and as part of that, they're trying to get good agreements over material that will give you hopefully more rights than you have under the Copyright Act to make use of those materials. And once this is a norm and in place, as I said, I feel that those changes will probably keep flowing down to other levels as well. You know, once you, you get a system and a culture of uh, depositing and sharing material with libraries in an electronic form and some standard um, terms that will go over that and that kind of thing, it's all going to fall into place. NED does exist, but it's in its very early stages. Um, and I'm not sure it's even actually operational yet. It is just. Um, I'm looking at everybody. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so 
that was the earliest thing to happen. But uh, as you can tell, it um, it uh, is something that could be really relevant, but um, a kind of sideways thing for a lot of you. But there are a lot of changes that have also happened that affect every single library and archive and institution in Australia. So let's move on to them. Um, and most of them came about through the copyright amendment, dig digital access and other preservations uh, and other measures act, which um, was passed only a few years ago. Um, and essentially that one, that act came about because of a new, uh, because of a new treaty that requires um, everybody to um, set in place minimum requ um, access requirements um, for disability um, access, minimum exceptions. Um, so Australia was implementing that and we said while we were doing that, why don't we add in a few more changes? And one of the big changes that we added that makes a big difference here is um, to this crowd is preservation. Essentially anybody who tried to work with Australia's old preservation laws um, know that they were broken. They really didn't work uh, in that they required, they had sentences like uh, you can, you know, preserve material once they are, once it's lost, stolen or destroyed, which is great. Um, a great way to, time to preserve um, your audiovisual or your published material. Um, but uh, the good news is that we fixed all that. Hooray! Um, so these um, changes that went through really did, I feel, almost entirely fix everything in preservation. They took away almost all the restrictions. Hopefully a lot of you were acting this way anyway under the Section 200AB flexibility um, provisions, which I'll talk about in a little bit. You were already doing best practice preservation um, practices, but just so you know, anybody who was still in doubt, uh, the law says you can do anything you need to do to preserve, full stop. That includes at the point of acquisition, there's no delay. There is one caveat, which you can see down the bottom, which is that uh, you are supposed to only uh, only convert people, material into digital format for preservation if the material isn't available to purchase in, that, in the preservation format you need. Uh, that was included because publishers were very concerned about the idea of uh, libraries using the preservation provisions to do replacement copies. We kept explaining to them that is not what preservation is about, it's not how it works. Uh, nevertheless, this was the compromise that came forward with the government. Um, but having said that, um, this is that caveat is very much focused on uh, the copy on the format that you'd need for preservation. We made it very clear, it's written in an explanatory memorandum that comes out with the Act, so that's got legal force. Um, so you can know essentially, unless you happen to be preserving in a, cop in a format that is commercially available, which I know almost never happens, maybe a little bit in audiovisual or photos, um, I didn't think so, yeah, then, uh, then it doesn't affect you at all. So essentially, I see this as uh, carte blanche, do whatever you need to preserve. As many copies as you want, on-site, off-site, send it to people, uh, any format. Other than that, that restriction, there's none. So just do whatever you want, laws out of your way. Hooray! <laughs> that was a good change. Um, at the same time, we also did a very similar, really broad, really excellent change for disability access. Like I said, this was the main reason for the Act existing. Um, and it was all about providing the international treaties about blind people, but our government uh, went the whole hog and just said, let's just say people with a disability, um, we're not limited to blind people. And they took away, we had two provisions which were intended to be work fairly well, but were quite bureaucratic and complex and a little bit hard to know how they applied. They got rid of them and replaced them with two better provisions, which do <laughs> very similar but stuff, but um, took away all the bureaucracy and stuff. Uh, and whatnot. The two provisions, again, I'm not going to be big detail with them here, um, but there's a great guide I'll tell you about in a second. Um, the two provisions that we've got in place now, there are, one is specifically for institutions working with people with a disability, and the other one is a broader one, a fair dealing provision that just applies to anybody. Um, the important thing to know is that both of them can be used by libraries. They actually use libraries as an example of an institution working with a disability in the explanatory memorandum again. So even if it's not your day to day, even if you're not Vision Australia, don't worry, um, you still probably qualify as long as it's something that you see as something you do, like not an unusual thing, we've never heard this before type thing, you know, something that you should do as part of your function, you're covered, doesn't have to be common. Um, and uh, that one, and the two provisions kind of work hand in hand to cover, to completely cover the field. Essentially, if you're doing something reasonable to provide access to somebody with a disability, you should be able to do it now. Um, 
uh, under one of these two provisions. The first one for institutions only has no fairness test, no um, kind of thought process about whether or not what you're doing uh, uh, is, you know, um, it, you don't have to step, jump through many hoops. You can basically just do what you need to provide access to somebody with a disability, but it does have the requirement that it's only if the um, material isn't available in the format that that person needs um, in a reasonable time. It doesn't actually use the normal commercial availability language that you guys will all be really familiar with, available in a reasonable time at ordinary commercial price, but it's essentially a very similar test. Um, but again, like the preservation provisions, um, this test is linked to very specifically to the material being in the format that person needs. So we do not see it as a big limitation. Basically, if you um, if the material uh, if the person uh, needs something in large format uh, and you have it in say 24 format and they need it in you know 36 format um, you know font sorry that's what I'm after 24 font and they need it in 36 font it's not commercially available in the format that they need even if it's just that they need it a bit bigger. If they don't have the right device to open it up, it's not available in the format that they need. Um, if they are a student who needs to be able to quote page numbers and whatnot, and it's available as an audio book, it's not available in the format that they need. So again, it's literally if, if the person could go and purchase exactly what they need, then you can't convert it for them. If uh, whatever is available to purchase isn't really quite what they need, it might do that kind of thing, you're fine to create exactly what they need. That's what, how the legislation works. So, and there's all, and like I said, there's no other hoops in this one. It's are you a qualified institution, which libraries and archives generally are. Um, the and then uh, is the material available to purchase in exactly the format the person needs. And other than that, you can just do whatever you want under that exception. Uh, oh, and the material has to. Oh, uh, sorry. So, and then if it's not available under that one, if for some reason you aren't a qualifying institution or if the material is commercially available in the format the person needs, but you still feel like there's some reason why they can't use in that kind of thing, you can probably do it under the fair dealing provision. So the second provision, um, the fair dealing one, is intended for people to be able to copy for themselves, for me to be able to copy for my neighbour, um, and for you know a company to be able to copy for their employee. There's no limit on, um, on what it allows or who's, who it can apply to. Um, it doesn't have any commercial availability limit, um, so if the material is commercially available, you, you might be able to um, still copy it. You might even be able to make commercial copies for people, that kind of thing. Um, but in this one, there's a fairness test. So essentially, you have to um, make sure that what you're doing is fair. So um, that includes probably thinking about the commercial availability. I will, will admit it probably is part of the fairness test. Is it fair to copy it for the people in these circumstances if it's commercially available? There might be circumstances in which it is. Um, uh, the, but more importantly, uh, fairness also would include things like um, uh, how are you making it available to them? Are you putting it up on a website that everybody in the world can see or are you just sending it to them directly, that kind of thing? Um, so those are the two limits, lines you have to think a little bit about is whether or not material is commercially available and how you make it available to people. But other than that, again, the law, copyright law is out of the way. Uh, you can do whatever you need, whatever you want to provide access to people with a disability now. And this is particularly relevant, I know, in relation to a lot of audiovisual material, things like that. We've already, one of the first cases that came up was um, video in actually the State Library's collection that had subtitles and the film was available on a DVD but without the subtitles, how did this apply, all that kind of thing. This is where um, the law gets out of your way and institutional policies will have to come into play, a bit of interpretation. Um, you know, we've worked really hard to make it really broad but of course having a very broad law does mean that you need to make your own decisions a little bit about how you limit within there. There was questions such as, should we make it available to, should, you know, okay, we can probably make it available to this person, they can't buy a copy that has the subtitles that they need, it was a deaf person. Um, uh, but uh, should we, if it's in video format, does that mean that, can we convert it into a digital format to give to them? Uh, do they have to, do they come in and they watch it on the video machines we have in on site? Uh, you know, do we send them a digital copy or do we, uh, you know, sort of make them send it back to us? Do we, do we send them an exploding copy that's going to, you know, be locked in a few weeks, that kind of thing? Uh, all of these things copyright law has no comment on. <laughs> so you guys have to make your own decisions, which shows 
uh, how important your policies are hand in hand with the law. But the good news is that we got the law out of the way in this circumstance, those two circumstances. Um, uh, and as I said, there's a wonderful guide, which I forgot to put up a slide to point towards, that we've just published in the last few weeks. We worked on it with the disability organisations in Australia and also the rights holder groups, so publishers, authors, um, copyright agency, all those groups who you might know about. We're all working together to try to get best implementation of these disability things. And so we have this beautiful fancy guide uh, that goes through all the copyright, gives you checklists, all that kind of thing, um, and goes in detail, but also uh, is available not only in PDF, but EPUB, um, EPUB and Braille and um, DAISY for anybody who works with disability groups. Um, unfortunately, I forgot to put the link in um, because I was just doing these slides this morning, but um, you can find it uh, through uh, AIPI is the name, the Australian Inclusive Publishing Initiative. And just ask me if you need to know. Okay, so we would change. So those are changes we've made to the library um, specific exceptions within the Act, that kind of thing. Um, an important thing to know that always comes up is what about TPMs? We have also fixed some of the TPM laws as part of this. Um, so uh, the TPM laws now they were changed just at the end of uh, 2018, or maybe, yeah, I think it was 2018, very quietly. Uh, no, I think it was 2017. Wow, time flies. Um, um, very quietly there were new regulations put in place that made really significant changes to the TPM laws. And what they did is they essentially um, extended the exemption, like the rule that lets you break a technological protection measure. For those who don't know, these are the digital locks that you find on audio, on digital files and things like that. You can now break them uh, for all of the library and archive provisions, um, all of the educational provisions and all the disability access provisions. So if you have a DVD and you need to copy it for somebody with a disability or for preservation or um, for uh, interlibrary loan, you can do that um, uh, under these new TPM laws. The only caveat is Section 200AB um, is not covered for libraries. It is for schools. We were a bit annoyed at that. We thought that we deserve the same coverage as schools, but whatever. Um, the, uh, so that means if you're doing this copying under the flexible dealing provision, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, you can't break the TPM to do that. However, you can uh, once you have a copy that you have, um, you know, without a TPM on it, um, because you have done it for another um, um, exception, such as preservation, which is covered by this exemption, you can use that copy to make other uses that are legal under the Act. So essentially the thing here is if you have made a preservation copy of something that was in, that was protected by a TPM, once you've done that, you have a TPM free copy that you can use to make your other provisions, uh, your other exceptions under. The, the government was very deliberate about this. This is not an accident. So you know. Um, uh, so yeah, it's really great. TPMs hopefully getting uh, now cleared out of the way. Like I said, we'd love it to apply to every single, but it's pretty close, pretty effectively close. And then the other big change that, I, that came through in all these changes that I thought would be quite relevant to this audience is a change to the copyright term provisions. Um, once again, uh, those of you who've tried to um, work out the term of your of um, materials and whether it's in the public domain, particularly for working with audiovisual materials, will know that it was not always easy and um, uh, can be quite complex. We can't, we haven't managed to fix everything. Uh, the fact that audiovisual materials often have like hundreds of different copyright works within them, in them we weren't able to fix, sorry. Uh, but uh, the laws were, have been simplified a lot to try to make it much easier to work out when, when the materials in the um, public domain and to make stuff fall into the public domain sooner. The two big changes that w where things will actually go sooner uh, with um, unpublished materials, um, we ended perpetual copyright in them. Anybody who's worked with letters or diaries or home videos will know that they are, well, maybe you haven't noticed yet with home videos, I don't know, um, but they are protected forever. Um, at the mo they have been protected forever. They are no longer as of 1 January this year. Um, uh, but also uh, orphan works. And I thought that would be the big news here, um, which is if you don't know who the copyright owner is. And so as you know, for a lot of materials, it's uh, life of the author plus 70 years is the term. What if you don't know who the author is? Now, um, 
there's a flat term for any materials where you don't know who the author is, any uh, works. This is not the audiovisual materials. What it does is orphan works uh, like diaries and letters where you don't know who the um, copyright owner is now have the same term as audiovisual materials, which is 70 years from creation or from publication. Um, so essentially, or from when they were made public, which isn't quite the same as publication, but pretty close. Um, essentially, if you, um, sorry about that. Essentially, there's really only three levels of copyright um, or copyright rules now that apply from now on, um, which is uh, life of the author plus 70 for your really standard materials, works and that kind of thing. For audiovisual materials, um, uh, it's seven years from publication or from when it was made public. Um, and for orphan works, it's the same, seven years from publication and when it was made public. <laughs> The made public um, uh, definition, as I said, is a little bit different from publication. It's a little bit tricky because it talks about even just putting it up online is a made public thing. Uh, two important things to remember for, the, um, for this room to remember, because um, we don't have time to go through the whole thing, is that um, it doesn't include exhibition of artworks, but it may include exhibition of other works. But, um, oh, sorry, the other way around. Does an exhibition of normal works, but it does include exhibition of artworks. That's right. Um, but, I might have got that one wrong way around. It really hurts everybody's brain. I swear, I really uh, do know this stuff more than almost anybody in Australia, and we've all had difficulty remembering these things. Um, but the other, the key one that's really um, uh, important is that it doesn't include you putting material up under Section 200 AB or any other exception. If you as a library or archive has put material in your collection up, um, have put it up online with the agreement of the actual copyright owner, then it does cover. So, um, or if you published in a book with the agreement of the copyright owner, then that means it's been made public. So that means the material has a uh, copyright term of 70 years from when that happened, if it was not made public before that. So say it was a letter in your collection, you digitized it, you've put up online and you got their permission to do it then it's 70 years from then. If you did it under an exception, so it was an orphan work, you didn't know who the copyright owner is, or um, you know, even if it's not an orphan work, there was too many you know, heirs and you couldn't work out who to get permission from. So you just did it under section 200 AB, you just made a you know, judgment call to put it up anyway. Um, then uh, it doesn't count as being made available, uh, made public. Um, so it is, 70 years from creation in those circumstances, um, unless it's being made public some other time. Um, and that's really important, um, a thing we did clarify, because those of you who know about this, this was the cookie, cooking for copyright reforms. This is the one that we all fought for. It was really awesome. Yay, everybody who baked for us, thank you. Um, but as part of that, we were putting up a whole lot of recipes online, including, say, Captain Cook's carrot marmalade. And there was a moment where we suddenly thought that Captain Cook's carrot marmalade might have a copyright turn of 70 years from cooking for copyright, which would have been very bad. <laughs> so again, it's very clearly spelled out. It's in the explanatory memorandum. Not everybody's noticed this. I have noticed some uh, copyright advice going around libraries and archives provided by perfectly good, valid copyright lawyers who don't get this distinction and have said that, yes, anything you've put up online has 70 years from when you put it up online. Um, uh, so it's really important that you guys start spreading the message that it, if you put it up under ex exception, it doesn't apply, it doesn't count, because um, we just need to make sure everybody gets that. But it is real, it's in there, it's written, I promise. Um, and, what, and the outcome of this was on 1 January this year, millions of th things fell into the public domain. Hopefully a whole lot of stuff in your collection is actually now totally in the public domain in a way it wasn't before. It's things, anything where the author died before, nine, anything, yeah, any orphan work that was created before 49 or made public before 49 and any material, unpublished material where the author died before 49 that hadn't been made public. There's a little bit of com complex transition thing, but that's it. We're looking at materials where the author died before 49, um, you couldn't put up pre previously, so unpublished materials uh, where the author died before 49 or orphan works where the author died, or where, that were created before 49. Suddenly huge numbers of things, it's awesome. All right. I was meant that to sound easier. I think I made it sound more complex, I hope not. <laughs> 
Um, then the other a whole different act, um, another set of changes that I went through, uh, I mentioned was safe harbours. Um, I wasn't going to go into these and then I was having a conversation with Jenna up in the corner right before I realised it was totally relevant to a lot of people here. Um, uh, so those of you who, uh, some of you will have already been across this, essentially there was, there's this area of law, uh, there's a safe harbour that's been in place in the Copyright Act for a decade or so, for about a decade um, about um, when people use ISPs and other service providers services to share material the liability that the ISP has for that. So you're providing a facility, somebody else comes and uses it to infringe copyright, what is your responsibility under that? This law has only ever applied to ISPs before in Australia. Everywhere else in the world it applies to anybody providing online services, don't even get me started on that. Um, but um, the, uh, the good news is that last year they changed the law to make it extended to um, libraries, educational institutions and disability groups. So the non-profits, there's still um, online platforms is the big group, group that's still left out, but the good news is that you guys are totally included. Um, what this means is that where you're providing facilities for people um, to, to um, access internet or upload material onto the internet, that kind of thing, uh, you now um, have the ability to access legal protections to ensure that you can't be held uh, you can't. You don't have to pay damages if they do copyright infringement um, over those systems. Um, uh, but the big caveat to this, the big new uh, headlines are: this is entirely voluntary. It's not an obligation on you, so you aren't required to do anything. You can make a judgment call as to whether or not it's worth your while to access these um, these safe harbors. The protection you get if you fall into the safe harbor. Is, um, under, uh, is protection from damages. So if you're actually found to be liable, which I will say the risk is fairly low anyway, but if you're found to be liable, they can't, you know, they, you won't have to pay money um, because somebody else did it. They were just using your facilities. Um, the second one to remember is that this is all about where you are just using facilities, uh, sorry, providing facilities that others are using. Um, so Almost all of you will have things like, you know, public computers um, and Wi-Fi systems, um, providing links counts. So like if you guys have an uh, online catalogue that links to third party materials like offsite, that can count. Um, and the other big one that libraries do, oh, there's another one it's on the next page, um, linking to external, oh, caching. And if you're also caching within your own systems, um, then these can apply to that. Um, uh, what it does, um, it also applies, so that's one category of things that I think most of you will be doing that it does apply to. However, there is also another category um, which is provide, letting people host materials, upload materials in onto a service that you're providing um, that it can apply to. Uh, that, that is the one that has more requirements. So this other one, this one that most of you are doing, um, which is just providing public computers, very low requirements, very easy to comply with. Um, there seems to be very little argument against you trying to do the steps that you need to do to comply with it. You get the ex little bit of extra legal protection, that's great. Um, the second category where you're providing hosting services for third parties is a little bit more tricky. You might want to make a judgment call, but the important thing to remember is it's only hosting services you're providing for third parties and clients and things like that. It's not your own collections that you're putting up online. And I think that's probably the biggest misconception out there in the libraries and archives community that these safe harbour provisions somehow apply to your standard digital collections, the ones that you're putting up. Um, they don't if you're moderating or if you're choosing the material or your staff are, um, then it doesn't apply. One of the things Jenna and I were talking about is, is it, does it apply if you are providing facilities that another institution is using to put things up? And that gets far more complex um, and a little bit tricky. It might in those circumstances. It's just about the fact that you're not touching the material, but it's kind of flowing through a technical system essentially that you're putting in place and you're not making a judgment call. That's really what makes the difference. Um, but the thing to remember here is that um, this doesn't apply, it doesn't change what you have to do about your own collections. It's only if you're providing these third party hosting services that the kind of more complex stuff applies. So entirely voluntary, you do get some good protections, it's nice protection to have. The risk to you is actually very low, however, so it's not urgent. 
you, you shouldn't be all rushing out thinking, oh, my God, if we don't put this in place tomorrow, anything could happen. You can make a judgment call as to whether or not it's worth it. Um, most of you just can do very, very simple steps to comply with the, um, the very basic one about providing public access computers. And those simple steps are in this lovely flowchart that I put together and is on our website. Um, this, is, this is do you qualify? And these are the steps you have to do. Um, you have to have, basically, you have to have a contact on your website uh, with a copyright type. You have to have a title like copyright officer or something of the person to send a notice to about copyright infringements happening over your service. You have to have a policy for termination of repeat infringers and apply that appropriately. Uh, that literally means you should have a conversation internally and record it, whether it's an email or better yet on a nice little, you know, A4 piece of paper that somebody's approved um, that says if somebody keeps using our service to infringe material, this is how we'll deal with it. Um, very unlikely to have to come into play. I don't think it's really come into play. And it's also the kind of thing that most of you already have some kind of policy on. Uh, or if you don't, uh, it doesn't hurt to have. It's a good idea. So that's an easy one to do. And then all these other three ones, uh, these other three t uh, not, tend to be things that you're doing already. Clearing your cache every day. That's one of the ones. Clear your cache quickly. Um, removing links if somebody tells you it's linking to infringing material. Um, so essentially, you only have to do two things that you're probably not already doing, which is have uh, copyright contact on your website and have a policy for termination. And you comply with these simple ones. So if you're providing public access computers and you do that, you're in the safe harbor. Hooray. Uh, <laughs> if you're providing the hosting services, a little bit more complex, the one, the one that I can think of that it would really apply to is NED. So NED, they are letting people just kind of upload their material and you have to sign something to say this isn't going to be infringing but they're not looking at it first so um, uh, it's a little bit more complex um, and the thing you have to do is you have to have, follow a very exact takedown policy now this very exact takedown policy is already very very similar to the one that NASLA has adopted um, and so it's probably very similar to the one that most of you are using even if you're not NASLA it's kind of the standard in the um, in the sector, and I would encourage you to definitely have takedown policies, even for no matter what. But you only have, but it's a little bit more bureaucratic. You only have to have this takedown policy if you are providing these third-party hosting services, not for your own content collections. Have your own policy for that, which could look a lot like this, but probably will be a bit simpler because this is just a bit clunky. That's all it is. Not the best written policy in the world. <laughs> process, sorry, in the world. So. Um, uh, but if you are providing third-party hosting services, it's probably worth putting this in place just to get that extra level of protection. But it's a voluntary thing. You don't have to. Okay. So that's – I might be going to more detail here. I don't even know what the time is. I've realised. I've got 15 more minutes. Uh, 15 more minutes. Perfect. Because those are the big ones I was going to talk about. Um, things that we are still uh, working on, there are things that we still want to fix. So we fixed those things. Hooray! Um, we want to fix them all. Um, uh, the first one and the easiest one to talk about is we want to standardise the rest of the um, library and archive exceptions uh, in exactly the same way we did preservation. Um, so uh, document delivery into library loan, the idea is to change them so that they apply to all materials, audiovisual materials, in exactly the same way as they apply to, you know, um, the current materials, you know, um, text or unpublished things. Um, it will make no difference. Um, this is very likely to happen. This seems to be something that we can reach an agreement with on rights holders. Um, it's more about getting it to the top of the pile um, to get it through legislatively. Um, but um, the, uh, uh, but we would love to hear from anybody who has particular things they'd like to do. Uh, that they feel like they can't do under the current exceptions because we can make it happen. This is, <laughs> but that's what we want to do. We want to make it happen. So come and tell us what problems you have and we will try to make sure it's included in the legislation, make sure we haven't missed any tricks. And we'll be consulting and stuff as much as we can um, to try to make sure we don't. But that's one thing that is very much on the agenda and likely to happen very soon. Um, another, The other things that are on the agenda have come up because the um, Productivity Commission and the Australian Library uh, Law Review Committee I uh, have both done reports in the last few years that said we need to update our copyright law, make it more flexible and things like that. Um, and here's some problems. And there's been a review that government started last year um, that was looking at this called the copyright modernisation thing. And it picked out a few of the key issues and said it will and then propose some reforms around that. 
with the election, we were all uncertain about what was going to happen, but it turns out um, that, uh, in fact, it's probably just going to continue. So that works out nicely for these reforms. Um, the Essentially, the big ones, that they're all relevant. All of them are very relevant to libraries, the ones being proposed, but the big ones people might be interested in are copyright and contract. What happens when you have a contract that um, conflicts with the exceptions? So you have a contract that says you can't share it off-site at all. You have a, a document delivery exception that says you can. What can you do? Um, there's very strong will, again, I think, uh, unlikely to be stopped. I think this is likely to happen. Uh, that at least the library and archive exceptions will be uh, made to overrule the contract in those circumstances. Those of you who are wondering, at the moment it's just grey area. It isn't actually that the contract overrules the exception. We just don't know. There was a big report, looked into it, came up with a conclusion, nobody knows. Um, uh, but so you can make judgment calls at the moment. What we'll be doing is we'll making it clear what happens in those circumstances. Because of course, as a sector, we want to really obey the law and hence we do tend to be quite risk averse and we do tend to follow the contract. But it could flip those things over, say for your e-resources contracts. Um, so that's one big thing that's on the horizon. Another one is more exceptions for orphan works. So the current, the term changes meant that orphan works at least would have a nice flat period after 70 years, you can do whatever you want with them. Hooray, that they're in public domain, but there's still 70 years. And as we know, a lot of digital materials become orphan works within a couple of days. Um, uh, and so we want to have some exceptions for um, people to be able to uh, make use of orphan works, particularly the glam sector, um, before uh, they fall into the public domain and make it clearer what you can do. Of course, you can under Section 200 AB, but it's not always clear. There's a bit of judgment there. Um, that also is likely to happen, I think. There's definitely going to be, it looked like there's going to be some changes on it. It's just what form those will be in. But we're hoping for at least, at a minimum, an exception for all of the GLAM sector library and archives to let you use stuff in your collection if it's an um, orphan work, full stop. Really simple exception. Yay. Uh, and then we're also looking at uh, trying to add more flexibility to the exceptions. Um, ideally, that would be through a broad fair use provision. Anybody who doesn't know, the difference, come and talk to me, I can talk about it all day, but at a minimum we're looking at replacing Section 200 AB with a fair dealing for libraries and archives uh, to make it just a bit better. Section 200 AB is great, but it doesn't always work great. So um, uh, so that's happening too. Um, so uh, let me know if there's anything that you want to know about that later. So fingers crossed all of these things will happen, but we're waiting and seeing, still in the process. And we want to hear from people who have problems. Come and talk to me about problems. Okay, so that's only message one. I will go more quickly under the other one. Sorry, I told you not to tell me I had more time. <laughs> um, so uh, message two is that you may already have more flexibility than you realise. This is a section 200 AB message. I won't go into, into detail. I'm sure a lot of you are already using it. But for those of you who don't know, there's an exception in the Act that essentially says you can do anything you need to, to maintain or operate your library as long as it is, uh, hang on, where do I have it? Oh, I think I managed to get rid of the provisions. I'm sorry, I managed to delete the bit when I know I put it in place. That, um, oh no, there it is. As long as it's um, the use is not commercial, it doesn't prejudice the copyright owner, it doesn't conflict with the normal exploitation of the work and is a special case. Easy, right? <laughs> um, I know that that sounds very confusing. Uh, this provision has been, but this provision has been around for a decade and we're all getting much more comfortable with what it really means. What it really means is that if you have something that you want to do that looks reasonable and isn't, you know, conflicting with sales of the original work, you know, you're not, you're not thinking of scanning the entire of the latest Harry Potter books and putting it up online for, um, you know, for everybody to see, uh, that kind of thing, uh, then uh, you can probably do it under, the, and it's not covered by another exception, you can probably do it under this, and it's, sorry, and it's non-commercial. That's what this means, is uh, you have this very flexible thing that basically says if it's part of doing what you do as a library, you should go ahead and do it, um, and, and it seems reasonable, it's not going to harm a copyright owner, just go ahead and do it. Rare. So this covers some of the key things people have been using for. Um, after a decade, people are using a lot, which is great. In the early days, people weren't so much because of the problems with it. But um, 
uh, is the digitisation of orphan works. Um, the newspapers project on Trove would not happen without Section 200 AB, or at least it would all be done under risk management because there's no way to clear most of the rights in those materials. So if you have a lot of um, material in older materials in your collection, a lot of them orphan works, or they have very complex copyright underlying them, you know, like newspapers that have separate copyright in photos and advertisements and things like that, uh, you can use Section 200 AB, you can make some judgment calls, set some boundaries, and then do mass digitisation of them and upload them, make them available to the public under Section 200 AB. It also lets you fill the gaps with document delivery, so if you have audiovisual materials in your collection which aren't covered very well by the document delivery provisions at the moment, then you can use Section 200 AB, AB to provide them to your U clients under that. Um, it's uh, slapped down the, you know, straight down the line what Section 200 AB. If you have somebody who wants material in your collection in Broome uh, for their granddad's birthday, and it's not research and study, which is what document delivery currently is um, focused on, you can make a judgment call and do it under Section 200 AB. So that's what this is all about. Oh, and exhibitions. If you want to do stuff in exhibitions, again, straight down the line, obvious Section 200 AB. The caveats are um, that, as we said, it doesn't apply to things like um, to, to commercial uses, so that things like um, uh, this down here, Doo -doo. Uh, things like um, publications or ticketed events, there's some grey area there because it does apply to cost recovery, everybody's unsure, so people are more uh, uncertain about that. Um, but most of the time, and joint projects with commercial entities, again, people are a little bit unsure about that, but 90% of the time, the things you want to do, you should be able to do already. And we want to replace it with a fair dealing because of these problems we're talking about that will make it a little bit better. But um, uh, but it's there for the time being. A little bit harder, but still workable. Um, a key thing to think about with Section 200 AB for those who want to, who aren't used to applying it is that to use it in hand in hand with risk management. Basically, what you do is you say, is there a fairly good argument? Do I think it sits under Section 200 AB? Yes or no? How low high is the risk? If, is the risk low, yes on yes, no, yes, almost all the time, just so you know, it's always low for you guys. It's great, nobody wants to sue a library. Um, and, and also you don't try to do cheeky things. I don't think any of you are putting Harry Potter up online. Um, and, then, um, uh, and then do some risk management uh, strategies, like things like having a notice that says, if you happen, we think this is an orphan work, if you happen to be a copyright owner, contact us, that kind of thing. Very small things like that. And that's um, the best practice for doing it. Don't try to just say, it definitely falls under Section 200 B. No question that, you know, no, don't try to eliminate risk. It's impossible. You just kind of make a judgment, you know, do a Section 200 B test and then some risk management. That's how you go. Risk minimization, not elimination is the message here. So yes, hopefully you can already do a lot of what you want to do for your audio, for your stuff. Um, oh, and the, one of the key messages that I nearly skipped over is I think that this also would allow digital collecting potentially for the non-legal deposit things, um, institutions. Now, this hasn't been tested. Nobody's gone to court over this or anything like that. Um, but as I said, the National Library for the last decade has been scraping material from online. Um, and whilst I, this predates me, nobody has said this to me in my own head. I feel like that was being done under Section 200 AB, collecting materials, um, because, especially because they're a legal deposit library, is part of their core work. This is for maintaining and operating the library. Um, it wasn't, they did, the, you know, it qualified or it was non-commercial, they weren't interfering with the rights holders market, all that kind of thing. Um, and certainly the new web archive that's been put up online, again, Section 200 AB. So those of you who don't, uh, who are interested in, um, digital collecting from materials that are online and are not sure about the copyright rights, if you're doing it for the institution for the purposes of including it in your collection, there's a good argument here. Think about it anyway. Do a test. Um, oh, we have, again, we have a lovely guide online, a whole book about this one too, with examples in it. Um, go and find it. Um, message three is that permissions are still important. I won't go into detail here because this was all the nice to have stuff. Um, but um, more and more people have been asking about what to do with their um, deeds and, the, and permissions. So this is uh, not only uh, gift and purchase 
deeds and agreements, but say you're you're doing some audio visual, um, sorry, audio histories with members of the public. How do you manage the permissions over that? That kind of thing. Um, some of the key messages here are that it is still really important that you do get uh, an agreement over all these materials. Um, uh, don't let the agreements take away your rights under the Copyright Act if you can avoid it. Essentially, uh, a lot of language we're starting to put into deeds um, uh, nowadays are, you know, to make use for the purpose of this project, or you know, or uh, you know, at a minimum as permitted by the Copyright Act. Um, to try to prevent people from inadvertently, but people who are saying, "Oh, I'm a little bit nervous. I don't want to give you permission to put it up online, so I'm not going to say you can provide public access." inadvertently taking away your right to provide document delivery, things like that. So try to set some kind of bar that the Copyright Act is the minimum and it's all above that. Um, and another interest, another key message that we're getting out there is that you can do things like, you can have a full assignment, great if you get a full assignment. If you don't get a full assignment, a very broad licence can be just as good. Make sure you say something like for the purpose of, you know, inclusion in the collection, et cetera, rather than spelling out for us to put online, unless you mean to do that, because uh, it will it will potentially limit you in a hundred years when we're all downloading things into our brains, as we've all found out with the birth of the internet, all of our old things, all of our old agreements didn't allow us to put them up online because they spelled it out to exactly what we were going to do with it. Um, so try and make them, if you include a list, it's good to still have a list of things that you might do with them, but as an example. So for example, uh, you know, putting it up online, blah, 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 but make sure it's not, it's inclusive, not exclusive kind of thing. And another trick that people often miss is, oh, so another thing is see if the person will give you permission about, um, give you a license um, to be able to give permission to others. That's the main benefit of getting a full assignment is if somebody comes to you and says, I want to publish this letter, you can say yes because you have all the rights. You can do that with, an, with a license as well. So even if people don't want to sign you the full rights, you can say, you know, you can, within the license, you can say also we have permission to grant others permission to use this material. Um, and it can be in X, Y, and Z circumstances. So a common one would be uh, we have the right to grant other permissions to use it in a non commercial manner. And you don't have that under the Copyright Act otherwise. So that's something you do need to have in an agreement if you want to give those kind of permissions directly rather than having to go back to the copyright owner every time. And a lot of copyright owners will be happy with that. Very akin to that is the giving them the option to put it under a Creative Commons licence or something. Um, one, of, one of the key tricks here is to, uh, you have, is to consciously decide whether or not you want to accept it under Creative Commons licence, i.e. you're just asking them to uh, licence it under Creative Commons licence, say, you know, you're using some, some kind of service like Flickr. People are uploading materials to Flickr and you say upload under a CC license and we'll put it in our collection uh, and it's under the CC license, in which case you are bound by the CC license. Or else, alternatively, you can say upload it to here and um, under this agreement, you know, under these terms which we've set for, we will use it for the purpose of inclusion in our collection uh, libraries. And in addition, we encourage you or you know require you to put a Creative Commons license for others to use. So you can see the differences. You have to make a decision about whether or not you want to be limited by the Creative Commons license, which depending on which one you're using might not be a big limit, but it's something to be aware of, or whether or not you want to take one license for yourself and encourage them to put a license on it to make um, for other people to use. And you're not bound by that license, you're just encouraging them to do it. Um, so I used to say that that was the best way to do it. I used to say that if you're taking material from people as part of a crowdsourcing thing or something like that, make sure you get, get a full license for you to make it use whatever uses you need and then give them the option or make it a compulsory thing that they also put a Creative Commons license on it for others. Um, but I don't actually say that so clearly anymore because I think people are a bit more flexible. Institutions are more happy to take it under a Creative Commons license and, and feel like it's best practice. So you can make a judgment call, but just know that that's, and that's a good tactic. That's one of the uh, and things, tools in your uh, thing. So the, fir the fourth um, message, which, I, uh, I, uh, which relates to this, and which I'm not going to have time to go through in de detail, 
was just to say that open does solve a lot of problems. If you can get people to um, provide materials to you with an open license on it, either under a deed of gift or as a crowdsourcing thing, that can make things a lot easier for you um, in the way, especially if you want to start doing some of the more uh, complex things where you encourage your users to make use of your collections to do things. Um, um, the Creative Commons license gives not only you rights, but it gives re your users rights and that kind of thing. And the same frame, I'm not going to go through it now. Uh, Ellen and I have already decided that we're going to try to do a webinar or something like that later in the year where we'll go through the Creative Commons licenses in detail. I'm going to work on the assumption most people have a bit of an idea about how they work. Um, but uh, just a very little plug, the reason why you might choose to go open under Creative Commons rather than just writing your own license, it says you can use this material in its own way, is because the licenses are really, have been written by hundreds of authors, of, of uh, copyright experts all around the world. I know I used to manage them, that was my job, managing the international volunteers for Creative Commons, um, and they really know their stuff, so they're really well written. Um, they, uh, but more importantly, they have the metadata. There's metadata, the Creative Commons metadata is king. Got a great slide on that one. <laughs> metadata is a love um, note to the future. And um, if you put it, if you use, apply the Creative Commons licenses appropriately, the material can be searched for by Google, Bing, all the big guys, um, and identified as open material. So it makes it much easier. Uh, easier. And of course, there's the standardization argument. Um, if you put your own license on something, uh, that says you can use it in these ways, X, Y, and Z. Uh, it is very like, unlikely that you will be able to get the language exactly right, that it will be able to be used with Creative Commons material in the same works. Well, not unlikely, but there's a big risk there that you'll just get the tiniest bit wrong and the materials won't be able to combine. So if somebody wants to make a great remix work using the photographs under Creative Commons licenses that they find on Flickr and the photographs under your um, bespoke license that you've written, and the licenses won't work together. There's a very good chance that will happen. So uh, opening your stuff up is good and excellent, and I encourage you to do it. Oh, Creative Commons also has a public domain mark for public domain materials. Okay, oh, so the last message here is, you know, open is good. If you love something, do set it free. To see what people will do, what wonderful things they'll do. We did use, I feel like a while, this used to be a message that you had to share more in the glam sector. 20 years ago when I started, people were very worried about letting those nasty teenagers touch their collections. And I don't think that's something we'd find in this room anymore. Um, but it's nice to have it there. Um, so thank you very much. I know this was a little bit of a crash course, and um, but as I said, there's a lot of very clear guides and where everything's written up with references to legislation, provisions and all that kind of thing, if you need to check out what I actually meant when I said this. Thank you. Questions because I figure we can shorten lunch by five minutes if we need to. Plus, I've got a question I want to ask anyway. Mm -hmm. So, um, please, um, and for those of you online, if you type in your question by a chat, I should see it. Mm -hmm. But kind of type quickly, please. Don't worry about typos because everyone else isn't seeing it. <laughs> um, I sometimes, when I'm looking at library catalogues, come across photographs from like they say they're 1925, 1920, yeah. whatever, and yet they've been digitized. And they've got a statement that says it's completely in copyright and any use you've got to talk to the library about. This does not seem right to me. Um, so could you please clarify? Uh, this was actually was one of the points I was going to talk about under the if you love something set it free slide and I totally forgot until you said it, so that's good. Um, uh, there's two or three answers to this. One is obviously a lot of institutions uh, uploading mass materials, feel like they don't have the ability to make judgment calls and so they just default to in copyright. Um, that's fine, uh, it's, it, but it's not best practice. Be best practice is if you have material that is in the public domain, try to market as that. Try not to be too risk averse in terms of requiring uh, people, like trying requiring people to prove that it's not in copyright if it looks like it's out of copyright. So for example, all photos before 1955 out of copyright in Australia, I promise you. Um, the only only problem would be if it was a photograph of an artwork and the artwork was still in copyright, let's say that. Um, so um, you can mark all of them as out of copyright. 
Um, and same with very old materials that where well, you're not sure whether the horse has died, that kind of thing. Try not to be too risk averse. Don't say if we cannot prove that it's definitely out of copyright, uh, we're going to assume it's in copyright. Make some lines that you're comfortable with. I'm not saying you should go too far the other way, um, but try not to default too much towards full copyright. And the second one is, and I think this is what you were getting at more, if you've digitised it, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't give you another, it doesn't give you copyright over it just because you've made a digital copy. Now, this is actually a slightly controversial comment in Australia in that the law is not 100% clear. In the US, it is 100% clear that a uh, digitised version of uh, public domain work, well, any digitised version of any work doesn't create a new copyright. So particularly, you know, high quality um, digitisations of public domain works, no extra copyright in that. It's in the public domain. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, in Europe, it's been less clear. They had court cases, so that's why we all knew there. In Europe, it was a bit less clear, and a lot of you might have heard about things. There's been a case in the UK about somebody from Wikimedia uploading a whole lot of material from the National Portrait Gallery in the UK um, that was all public domain material that they've done really high quality digitisations of, and the public and the National uh, Portrait Gallery didn't like that, that kind of thing. Um, it has been unclear in Europe, but they've just passed new laws. Their new copyright directive says that you cannot claim copyright in those kind of materials. Um, so it's going to be clear in Europe now. And that kind of clears up a lot of the question mark in Australia. We haven't had our own case, so we'd look at what other people are doing. The fact that the two biggest chunks of the world had two different rules was, you know, a little bit problematic for it. But now I think I can say fairly confidently that it's unlikely that even in Australia, you would get a copyright of those materials. But more importantly, it's not good practice. If you're a library or an archive, I know that we do love our materials and we want to make sure that they're well protected and we do spend a lot of money on digitising, making high quality ones. But if, uh, but we are access institutions and it's not best practice to um, say, to claim copyright in, you know, your high quality scan of, um, a, you know, 1000 year old work, uh, it seems, wrong somehow that you, you, you're trying to restrict, restrict people from using that 1000 year old work um, because you spent money on the scan. Um, it's not what our sector is about. So try not to do it unless you have a really good reason and probably can't in Australia anyway. Excuse me, sorry, I have two questions but they're related. First one is, does the Act define preservation? Uh, no, no, the Act does not provide um, define preservation at all. Okay. And I'm wondering with document delivery exceptions moving forward, is there any discussion around thought TPM? Yes. Uh, or being able to say we, we don't want you to apply that at all or any kind of way that I'm thinking about encryption for audiovisual material. And so requiring the copyright owners to take it off or yeah. um, uh, they can do that under the legal deposit law. Under legal deposit, uh, the new legal deposit laws, you can go back to them and say you have to take the um, the TPM off. Mm. I don't think you can so far under um, uh, our under the other law uh, under things like preservation, document delivery, and things like that. So if you've got it purchased it some other way into your collection or it's been donated or something. Um, but not through the legal deposit law. You can't go and ask them to take the TP. Or you can. You can always ask, yeah, um, but you can't require in, them. That's done in good faith with yeah. producers at some point. Mm. And some viewers some don't. And I'm just wondering whether I'm always looking for a loophole to mm. get people to lodge what we so we don't have to go through the effort of removing that encryption or that whatever it is. Whether there's if if we're looking for a loophole, I would look at the legal deposit deposited versions to see if you can, um, you know, if they don't have it on it or if you can uh, work with an institution that gets them uh, through that way to go back and request that they deposit it without a TPM. I know it's hard to get, the law saying that you can unlock a TPM is totally different from you actually being able actually to unlock a TPM. Um, but it does at least say you can, you can do, it. do it now. Hi, I'm Andrew Long from uh, the Coast Harbour Council. Uh, I have a question that is sort of an extension of the previous question about uh, 
Um, you mentioned that we can do whatever is necessary. Maybe about commercial works mm -hmm. in preservation form. Mm -hmm. So who, who actually decides what the preservation? You is? guys do. So mm -hmm. I decide. You decide. Um, yes, That's and uh, not that I'm encouraging you to define your preservation formats as one that is not commercially available. However, uh, if uh, you know if your preservation format happens to be one that's not commercially available, then that totally qualifies under the law. Just in that regard, what would be defined as a format? I mean, if a wave file is that so? Yeah. So you could download a wave file from say. You know, one of those high resolution things, but mm. a wave file that's even higher resolution and it has enriched metadata, and it's still a wave file. Uh, yes, actually, I would say that, um, you know, it's, it, it's just the same kind of rule that we have in the disability provisions. If there's some functionality that you need with that file or a certain level of quality and you can't purchase it like that, it's not commercially available in a preservation format. So, literally, you have to be able to purchase exactly the thing that you would be putting into your cloud server or your thing out the back, your locked cabinet, locked drawer. Um, yeah, you would have to be able to purchase exactly that thing for it to uh, stop you from preserving it. Mm. Okay, please join me with, uh, in thanking Jessica. That was great. Yeah. Now we've got a five minute stand and stretch session here because trust me you'll need to stand and stretch before the next hour and because it is only a five minute stand and stretch and it's a stand up, talk to someone who you don't work with and preferably you don't know and say something from that earlier session that you would find, you'll be finding useful in your workplace. I, for those of you online, we'll be coming back on the second link really soon.